Ladies, we are, wait, ladies and gentlemen, I should say, I know we've got some dads here, but we're going to get started here in about two minutes, two minutes, an order. Lee Drogan, the campaign manager for Next Generation Texas at Texas Public Policy Foundation. I know many of you that are here, and I want to first off express my gratitude for every mom, grandmom, and just concerned woman or man that made the time to come out here today. Um, I have three littles three that are under five, five and under. And so I tried to plan this around us moms who have a lot going on in the morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, I know, like me, several of your days start sometimes at five or six in the morning, so thank you again for joining us. Um, this, this event came to fruition um, after about a year of thinking and talking to several of you and my friend and panelist here, Heidi Cruz, who um, has, has been a part of the school choice movement, the parent empowerment movement, the mom empowerment movement for a very long time. Um, she's worked with me when I was over at the American Federation for Children, and she sits on the, on the board as our chairwoman here in Texas. Her passion for her children, first and foremost, but also making sure that all the moms out there that are busy running the day-to-day -day of their lives, as well as raising their children, fighting for what is right, is how we kind of got together and came up with this idea again a year ago. So I'm so excited. That was I wasn't even going into my introduction for, for, for Heidi, but I'm glad again that you guys are here. I will just kind of kick off the day with, with saying what we're here for. We are here because like you all, I know that there is no one on the face of the earth other than my husband who loves my children like I do. I and him should be the ultimate authority in all decisions. And first and foremost, I should absolutely be the ultimate authority in their education. That means the education that I want them to have both with rigor and curriculum, but also the values, the values that we hold dear and that we wanna pass on to our children. And I see a lot of you nodding right now because I think that that is where we see a huge groundswell across our state and across our nation where so many parents, particularly moms, we're mad. We're mad. The values that we try and instill <clears throat> in our children, so many places are being, they're being torn down. They're being told we're wrong. And then we see mom, whose parents are, their, their children are coming in and they're sitting down at the dinner table and they're shocked to find out what they just learned and what they were told in school. So as moms have united together, whether you're a member of any of our sponsors and, and co-hosts here, we've got Moms for Liberty, we've got AFPI, AFC, TPPF, Parents Defending Education, and Libre, AFP, so many amazing groups that have unified and said, you're going to listen to us moms. And part of listening to us, part of our parent empowerment tour, which by the way, this is the 15th stop that we filled a room of parents going, I'm with you, I want my power back, is we wanna talk about quality, making sure that the quality of the curriculum and the quality of the value sets that are being instilled in our children are what we want. We wanna make sure that there's transparency. We have to know what's being taught to our children across the board no more hiding nefarious plans under program titles all of it we have to know and sign off on 
Number three, we have to be given the respect that we deserve as parents, as moms, as the ultimate decider in what our children are learning and when they learn it. And number four, the choice to send our child wherever that we know that they will get the best education to grow up and be happy and prosperous. Because that's what we all want, right? We want our children to grow up and live happy, productive lives. So that's what we're gonna talk about here today. And I will jump into introducing these wonderful panelists here, all of them dear friends who have been in the fight for years on empowering parents, empowering us moms. First, I'm gonna introduce Ellen Chasler. Many of you, particularly around here, um, know Ellen. She was the lone standing strong conservative that sat on the Austin City Council for many years, fighting to keep property taxes low, fighting to try and lower them. <laughs> um, I also standing up for parents and standing up for the value sets that, that we hold. Um, Ellen also, yeah, please, yes, yes. She also, um, after her experiences of advocating, also working here at TPPF, running city council, now running for state rep, she also had the time in raising her three children to write a book, which is called Step Up, How to Advocate Like a Woman. Which, so she is perfect to be here with us and to share her knowledge and experience so that all of you can advocate for your children as well. Our second panelist, uh, um, she, I, I kind of jumped into it, but my friend Heidi Cruz, she is a mom of two beautiful young girls. She is the wife of Senator Ted Cruz, who is also on the front lines fighting for us day and day. She also is a full-time career woman, um, managing director at Goldman Sachs. And, and sometimes people don't realize how passionate and how involved she is at making sure that moms like us have a voice particularly on the, whether it's the phone calls or the late night conversations of what we want with the Senator. So thank you for being here. And finally, um, Stacy Hawk, who has joined us and been again, a leader for as, as long as I've known you, really both on the front lines and behind the scenes, directing and helping provide guidance, helping provide resources so all of us can come together for events. But Stacy is a mom of four, four boys, young boys we've got a we've got a high schooler now so um but she has an immense amount of experience with sharing about why innovation in the school system is so important every time i have a the opportunity to talk to stacy she brings me so much knowledge about what is actually going on in the classrooms, what schools are available. She brings information about micro schools and blended learning and technology and the ways that we can make sure that our students here in Texas are the best and the brightest. I say a lot of times that, you know, we have booming economy, one of the top economies, well, in the world as a state, but in the, in the country, um, we have so much innovation. We have so much growth. People are coming here to share our values and to be able to live the life that we're all fighting here in this room to protect and make sure our children have. And I, I can't express enough the gratitude that I have for Stacy always being on the front lines and supporting whatever she can. So thank you. And I cannot wait to hear what all of you have to say about empowering moms and empowering, emp <laughs> yes, yes. And, and improving our school system across the board. Um, the, the last thing I will note is that we have a wide variety, both on our panelists here and moving forward, of the choices that moms made, whether it's a private school, public school, a public charter school, a micro school, blended school, home school. You're going to hear from moms who have experiences across the board. Once we get through asking some questions, I'm going to open this up because I really do want to hear what y'all think and what your questions are about how, again, when we walk out of this room, we're united in our desire to empower parents. So I'm going to start off with, with going to Heidi, who um, has a, well, the Senator has been so, so passionate about, about fighting for school choice. He's never made a secret about the fact that he believes that this is the civil rights issue of our time. And so I know with your involvement on pushing for parental empowerment that you've shared with me how blessed you feel to have choices for your children and the choices that you and the senator are able to make together. Can you share with me a little bit about your experience as a child in education, but also how that's 
influenced y'all's decisions for your girls? Sure. I don't know if we need these mics. I guess maybe we do. Um, well, I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, Mandy, thank you for pulling this together. And it's so nice to be here with you and to meet each of you. Um, this is a powerful group in this room. And um, I'm in a business where a lot of women do make the decisions for their household. And sometimes some of the men forget that at least out sort of at the cocktail chit chat. But we sort of know um, most of the decisions for our children, our money, our well-being as our families. Um, there's a real gut instinct with moms. And um, I'll just, I, I do wanna answer your question, Mandy, but I'll, I'll give a couple quick comments. Mandy and I go way back really grateful for Mandy because her husband John was my husband's first friend in politics and John used to come over to our house and he would be asked to stay till two and three in the morning while Ted Cruz convinced him that as a completely you know unknown lawyer in Texas that he should run for office someday and John was the only person that would listen um, and I was really grateful when Mandy came along because it really put John together John was <laughs> John was one of the funniest people I've ever met. He used to be with Ted and I constantly when Ted was doing his early campaigns. And then Mandy came and John, life took off for John. So um, John's very lucky to have you. Uh, Mandy's such a leader in our state. And the second thing I just wanna say before we jump in is what an exciting time it is to be in Austin, Texas. Um, I know Stacy moved here from an incredibly robust career that she and her husband have had many years ago and this place is taking off. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that we as conservatives can do um, the nation's looking at Austin. And if we can get some of these core things right, I know sometimes it feels like Austin's the toughest place to do it in Texas, um, but it's a real national national hub here now. So to answer um, Mandy's question, I, I sort of reflected, when did we first start thinking and talking about school choice in our family? And it was before we got married, actually. Uh, Ted was at the Federal Trade Commission early in the Bush administration. And one of the studies that he took on was a competitive study in education to look at what would happen if we introduced competition into the public school system? And at the time, the DC schools did not have school choice. I think they've made some progress towards it. And he has always viewed this as a policy matter as really bipartisan. And so I think there's no doubt that from a business perspective, the numbers show that when we have competition, things, things improve. And so I think we, we need to uh, take the emotion out of some of this and just go to the basic things that we all know in a capitalistic economy that when you have competition, um, it cream rises to the top and people want to be part of success and we just don't have that culture in our public schools. I've been involved in various school choice organizations throughout um, my career. Uh, Mandy articulated some of, of Ted's um, focus on it, but I've realized recently and being part of AFC and also at an organization called um, Academic Choice and Education ACE and visiting some of these schools that I actually was a product of school choice. Uh, my father was a small town dentist um there was no debt he built her own house they still drive a 1976 car um but we went to private school and i never felt like i went to private school because it wasn't a prep school i don't think it cost much money but it was at our church and my dad was chairman of the school board my mom made the hot lunch for the school and that's where we lived um it was a small school but i took for granted that we had the same values at school as we did at home and I, I feel a little tearful about that because life's gotten bigger and I grew up in California, you have to excuse me for that, um, <laughs> but sort of being far from my family now and in a, a, a life where my husband's in DC and we're in Houston and I'm working and our kids are in school, you realize how um, disconnected your home life can be unless we as moms really focus on this. And I think it was, it was better in the 70s or the 60s when you know, towns were smaller and people went to church and their school was there and um, moms were at school all day. So I really um, value that and um, I, I value it in reflection. I thought it was too small of a world and I wanted to get to New York City and marry a Texan and go see the world. And I did. Um, and in doing that, I look back to my little school on the hill with the church next door and think that's that's what we all want. Um, that's what we want for our children. So I in our children's lives we've made the choice to send them to a private school um we've been blessed to be able to do so and that's where ted has been very outspoken that this is the system's wrong you shouldn't have to find the financial means to get your kid a basic adequate education and so we're going to fight and work really hard to make sure that all parents have that choice um yeah, it's necessary thank you for sharing that um 
I'm going to move on to Stacy because you have risen to the top of the education ladder and you've come out of the esteemed MIT with two degrees. And when you came back to Texas and y'all set up your life with your family, I think you immediately started advocating from what I can remember. You started advocating for every child to be able to have access to innovative school opportunities that best suit them and that kind of break the mold from what we see right now. Can you share a little bit about what you saw growing up in Texas, going off to a school like MIT, and then coming back and really wanted to establish opportunities for more moms? Absolutely. Thank you, Mandy. And thank you all for being here today. And, you know, as Heidi just so honestly pointed out, education is so personal to all of us. We all have our own experience with education and what that's meant for us in our lives and again with our families and what that means you know for the next generation i benefited from a public school that was a magnet school here in austin where i grew up and when i went to mit i was extremely well equipped and i realized how grateful i was for that private school wasn't an option for us and the fact that I was able to go to a school that was really suited towards my love and acumen for math and science was a gift. I was with other students who loved that. I was with subject matter experts who loved that. And I got to make that choice to self-select into it. It wasn't easy or convenient. It started at the crack of dawn on the far side of town. So my parents really had to sacrifice to get me there. I had to sacrifice to get there. No high schooler wants to wake up at 6.30 in the morning, but it was worth it to me. And, um, and I was really taken aback by what a gift that was um, and how that opened doors for me and pushed me and propelled me far beyond where I would have gone if that option hadn't been available to me. So fast forward, and what I have found is that not just my passion for allowing students to have a lot of agency and autonomy on pursuing their interests and their acumen, and knowing that each of us have our own unique gifts and we all come from unique families who have our set of values and those things need to be honored and respected and propelled and we need to be lifted up for them um, i also am a huge believer in what heidi also referenced which is the productivity of free market where free individuals can make choices for themselves and where and where innovators and entrepreneurs can try things and take risks and things that work capital floods to it and so everyone ends up better off with more productive solutions um, it naturally honors pluralism it allows people to be the unique individuals we all are um, and it tends to drive up productivity and thereby lowering lowering costs and expense. So what we know today, our education institution today, is the opposite of that. It discourages risk, it discourages pluralism, it's extremely expensive and unproductive. And sadly, we have come to realize a compulsory government-run monopoly, which we understand is the least productive system that we could possibly design. It may have been extremely productive when it was originally instituted 150 years ago, but it hasn't been allowed to take the risks and make the changes that would propel it to what is possible today. So what I see is a ton of human capital being diminished with its potential. And I think that is our lowest hanging fruit as a state, as a community, as families, I do believe, as was referenced here, that we are best served when our work and our vocations and our family and our relationships and our faith and our values can be woven with integrity and authenticity into the facets, all the facets of our lives. And um, for all those reasons, I think school choice is far long overdue here in Texas and grateful to Senator Cruz and now Governor Abbott and lots of other political leaders with the support of TPPF and all of you in the room. Today and now might be the day in Texas. Thank you so much. Ellen, you, like 
all of these ladies have been kind of on the front line seeing the inner workings of government, but also being out there and talking to parents and moms in so much of your work, as well as your home life with a mom, as a mom. And I know our children are in similar ages, so we've just kind of started the, the K through 12 journey together. Um, can you share a little bit about how you made the choice for your daughter's school and what has what yeah what you what had what impacted those decisions and what you're hearing when you're out talking to women and moms um all across the state and the district okay is this on hi uh well first of all i just want to be say thank you thank you thank you so much for everybody in this room taking time out of your schedules to be here today we are all so busy like there's not a single <laughs> woman that i talk to hey what how have you been that says oh i've just been relaxing and enjoying and no we're all so busy managing a million different things whether your kids are young or grown or uh, whether you work or stay at home or or a combination of all the things uh, so it really means a lot that you guys are taking a couple hours out of your day today to be here because i really do think that this is um that parent empowerment and the ability to make sure that our kids are getting the best education for them is the is one of the most important and the most critical issues that we are facing uh as a state and honestly as a country uh my personal i mean i'm still figuring i mean the, th the answer to your question is that i don't know my daughters are six and four and uh, my son is two and a half so you're right i'm uh, managing life and also trying to figure out what the best place is for each of them to go to school but the reality is is that that decision is probably not going to be the same for all three of my kids because even the best school and we live in a great school district like travis isd we live in we uh have great elementary schools but even the best school is not the right school for all of my children juliet she likes structure she's a great listener and rule follower as a lot of firstborn children are uh my second she is an independent firecracker and is gonna threaten is not gonna do well the first time that she has a teacher tell her to be quiet and sit down and stay in her seat it's not gonna go well for that teacher so <laughs> Um, so, so, you know, I've, as I am learning more about this from a policy perspective, and I will say this is something that school choice is something that I became passionate about as a young 20 something capital staffer who, before I even had kids, I mean, it, it was before it, it was not something that directly impacted me, but I saw waiting for Superman, the, the documentary, and I just, it was so eye opening to me to realize how many of these kids are in our state in one of the most prosperous places to live in the entire world how many how many children are trapped in failing schools and why in the world were are, are we not doing something about it so um so i, I yeah so I, I don't have a good answer to your question because i'm learning more and more about my kids each day and i'm the one that knows that, that knows them the best and so i look forward to as they continue on their journey and even honestly Another thing that I've struggled with, which is just such a minor, tiny little detail, but my daughter's birthday is September 3rd. And we all know, I mean, anybody who has kids with a birthday in August or September, it's this constant struggle of, okay, do you put them, you know, do, are they the oldest in the class? Are they the youngest in the class? And, and that was a wake up call for me is why do we have these arbitrary, the, the, these like arbitrary lines where you're put into these buckets at such an early age? And one of the, the one of the reasons that I have chosen to to keep her in a private school for this year in particular, I don't know what we're going to do next year, is because I wasn't ready to make that decision for her. I didn't know, you know, I didn't. She has been the youngest in her class. I don't know if she's socially ready to continue to. Be, I mean, it's just again all these things that we deal with as moms wanting to do the best thing for our parent for for our kids, and we have the luxury. I have the luxury of making that decision for them. Where a lot of, and I just want the same right for every other parent. Thank you. Are they not all amazing? Everybody's story is different. And I, I really, I, again, I've met several of you in the crowd and heard your stories. And I do love hearing the personal story behind what makes each woman up here and each woman in the audience and each woman parent watching on um, our live stream out in the, the internet world. Um, because the reality is that all of us are different. All of us have different children and they all have different needs. And so, to empower a parent with choice, and I'm gonna go back, 
to, to Heidi. To empower a parent with choice means giving them the opportunity to select the best education. And I think most people, when you ask that, agree, yes, a parent should have that choice. But there's some resistance in this, and, and you talked about it a little bit, Heidi, about how this should be a nonpartisan, bipartisan, this should not be a battle, particularly in the great state of Texas, where that we, we champion our freedom and individual rights. So Heidi, can you share a little bit about your discussions and, and your thoughts on um, this being a, a bipartisan issue, a unified issue that we should all, particularly every single mother, regardless of where, where, where you coalesce, what aisle you sit on, who you back uh, on politician, why is this an issue that we should all join together, lock arms as moms, be empowered and say, it's our choice and it's our right? Mandy, thank you for phrasing the question that way because um, whether I like it or not, and most days I actually do like it well enough, um, I live a very political life and I um, am in the private sector, so I don't realize that every moment, but um, there are times when I realize these conversations and reflecting on the constitution and taking a book on a vacation that's sort of the basics of the founding principles of our country, because I have to hang out with Ted Cruz today and I just need to know something. <laughs> Uh, and I want to actually ask them some questions about things that I've been wondering about. These are, you know, great things that people who aren't in the back and forth and throes of politics maybe don't contemplate as much on. And the reason I say that in the context of this question is, I think there are so many issues in our country that are fundamentally bipartisan. If we could get rid of some of the politics and the mudslinging and, and the divisiveness that's really gotten exponentially worse, um, that that we would find a lot of things. Uh, people can come together on and especially moms. There are no moms who don't want the best for their kids. There are no moms who don't want school safety. I, mean, I don't care if you're pro Second Amendment, like I am, or some of my Californians that I left behind less so, but everyone wants their kids to be safe. And we get so caught up, and I think 90% of the time on the airwaves is about stuff that's not the issue. And so when it comes to schools and even even values, I think there's probably a wide range of values that people think are appropriate to be taught to lower school. I accept that, we can have a discussion about that, but no one wants their child to grow up uneducated in math and unable, unable to read and inappropriately introduced to things about adult life that they can't understand. I don't care if you're the leftist most liberal person <laughs> in the country, I don't think anyone really wants that. And if we could get rid of the politics, I think if we could have, you know, it, it might be a much more difficult session, but if we could have this room full of half Democrats and half Republicans, I want that because I want to start duking it out with the left so that we can get to something that we can all agree to, because I don't actually believe that we disagree as much as it feels like we do. And I think this issue and this election this year um, is a prime time to fight it. I've seen many polls from Ted's people, from my company, from being in business meetings about what are the biggest concerns of Americans in this election. Um, I'd love to ask the audience, what do you guys think it is? Just hands, shout outs, what, what's the number, you know, number one? Okay, I'm totally with you. I would have said inflation and immigration. Those are five and six and seven. Do you know all the top issues, the top four, have to do with um, the breakdown of our democracy, civil unrest, divisiveness, our culture? It's not just the right, the left is troubled by it too, and we're battling each other. But what's at stake in this election is the basic fundamentals of our of our culture, what we're teaching our kids, safety at schools, the breakdown of having choice and being able to be an American. Um, so I just give you that statistic. Um, don't want to go on, but no, this is front and center, and it is, it is a bipartisan issue. I think you're ex you're exactly right. I have I, I have no doubt that you have the latest polling and the numbers, and I think that's true. Again, in the month. When we meet each other out, we don't look at each other and say, 
who do you vote for? What party do you align with, right? We, we talk about mom stuff and it always comes down to caring about our kids. And I think you're exactly right. If we could pack the spaces that we occupy and talk about empowering parents, empowering moms, we'll find that we're not so divided. So thank you for sharing that information. Um, something that, that that's a, a good segue into, we heard um, Governor Abbott really take the lead starting in May, saying that he knows and will fully fund our, our public schools. He will support parents to be empowered with the right to choose whatever school, if that includes an amazing public school, a private school, a blended school, a homeschool, whatever it is. He's leading this charge to empower all of us. And I know, um, Stacey, that you've had conversations with him and things like that. And I don't know the conversations that you had, but every time that we talk, you share more about innovation and what's out there and what is being brought to the forefront in education that is years in advance of what the actual public will know. But I would really be curious to hear about what is going on? What are some of the micro schools that I know that you have, you, you've pushed because it brings out the best in kids and, and which enables our society to run better, our families to run better, our government to run better when we have innovation brought into it. So can you share a little bit about what's going on that, again, people will not probably hear about until, because the, the media is not gonna talk about it, y'all. They're not gonna talk about it until it's absolutely 100% you know, they cannot avoid it. But right now they are, but you know, can you share with us what is going on in some of those secrets? This is such an exciting time in this space and I love it. I think more than ever before, we're seeing capital and in innovation and just strategic thinking pour into K-12 education. And I truly believe that given the investment and the interest of those kinds of entrepreneurs and that kind of thinking to reimagine what is possible in K-12 paired with the reality that the 21st century is going to look different. It's going to continue to look different as we progress through time and that we can't stop progress. Um, even though there's a lot of systemic constraint to controlling capital in the space and to controlling people's choices in this space people are starting to act around that and greater number than they ever have it is every week and some weeks it's every day that i talk to someone who is starting a new business or a new school and wants to talk about what their product is or what their model is and how they are serving children better than what's available today and then it is also every week that I am talking to families, mostly moms, who are looking to make good decisions for their kids. And they want to know what's out there. So if I had a magic wand, I would instill in every child and every parent the reality that the education path before them is their choice. And I would also somehow magically know, let them know, have them know what all the options are that are available to them today. I am finding that families are more willing than ever to go the non-traditional route, to try something new, to do a different model that works well for their family. And what they're finding is we can live and work in a way that looks different than the traditional um, farm-based schedule from 200 years ago. Families want mobility. They want ability to go deep in a subject area that their child's interested in. They want to be able to travel on a schedule that suits their family. Um, they wanna come around their kids with their interests and let kids move at their own pace um, and with their own depth and with values and ideals that are not in conflict with those held by their family. So all of these innovations, these new models are starting to support that. And you've heard about it. You've heard about technology leveraging kids being able to move at their own pace. We know more about brain science and how kids learn than we ever did. And we can incorporate that very effectively. You're hearing about families getting together and creating pods or micro schools. And that tends to be something that is extremely easy to pop up because it's much less dependent on major 
facilities and major capital to get going on day one. And those, those kinds of innovations are what can take hold very quickly and are just peppering the land. And the kind of policy that Governor Abbott is talking about and TPPF and others are talking about is going to add fuel to that fire because it's going to better allow families to make choices and take advantage of those choices and innovators to have a market. Thank you. Um, we can do one more question and then we'll take a few questions from the audience. Um, Ellen, in your experience in the Capitol, in City Hall, and back in the Capitol, um, <laughs> can you share um, what you hear and what you know that those involved in leadership in government are saying about empowering parents, empowering moms, and what you hope to see happen here in the next year. Yeah, and, and I actually wanna kind of combine this and follow up with what Heidi said, uh, and the question that you asked about the bipartisanship and the way that we've seen that. It, it, the things that I hear in the Capitol are totally different than the things that I hear in my district talking to the regular people. And it, and it is so strange to me, it seems like this issue almost more than any other, there is such a big disconnect between what individuals in rural red counties in Texas, uh, what those families believe and want and, and, and the decisions that are being made at the Capitol. And I've seen this going back from uh, when I was chief of staff to for, for Jason Isaac, who I'm so excited to be serving with, hopefully come, come January, hopefully serving with his wife now. But um, we filed a bill, uh, House Bill 300, which was a, a, an innovative way to allow a specific school district to opt out of the education code and create their own standard, a, school, a public school board to create their own uh, goals, submit a plan to TEA, but really have a lot of flexibility on uh, this high school is going to be career and college readiness. Uh, this high school is going to focus on this thing, like really give them the freedom of school choice without the, within the public education system, without the unfunded mandates that often come from uh, the Texas legislature. And guess what? We got minority Democrat members, inner city members to sign on to that bill, including Sylvester, Sylvester Turner, who is now, you know, very liberal uh, mayor of Houston. He was a joint author on that bill. And so we thought, oh my gosh, this is a, we, we thought outside of the, the, the traditional public school versus private school versus school choice, we're giving public schools choice. Um, we had a bunch of co-authors sign on, we were so excited. Uh, well, the teachers unions got involved and uh, those members started getting calls from their from the teachers unions and they took their name they all took their names off the bill um, and ultimately we didn't get it passed but this was what like 10 years ago um, and so I, I felt like that was a little glimpse into they knew that that's what was best for the kids in their district they knew it they knew it but the political powers that be um, haven't been able to let those members do what is right for their constituents. And then on the flip side, I am one of the, I think very few, if not maybe only, I need to, I need to look. But you know, I'm I'm the Republican nominee now for House District 19, which is a, a rural five county Texas Hill Country, you know, Bernie, Marble Falls. Um, and I know from the polling, the polling and the and the the it was on the ballot, right? That 87% of the people in my district support some kind of school choice. Um, and yet it is rural Republicans in the Texas legislature that often have been the uh, the, the, the stick in the, <laughs> in the spoke, the wheel spoke um, to getting something passed. And why is that? It's often, I, I hear, well, the, the school district is the biggest employer in my district. Well, that's great. And you know what? They have great schools in Fredericksburg ISD. They have great schools in Bernie ISD. And honestly, a lot of those school board members, they're not scared of school choice because they know it's not gonna impact their kids because their families are thrilled with the education that they are get getting in their local school, school district. The kids that, it, that, that need it and that are gonna benefit from it are the inner city schools. And so I think I have also tried to tie the two things together, Robin Hood, right? I don't think there's anybody in this room who's like, I am really excited about the way that Robin Hood is uh, funding our public education system. I think it's super efficient and effective. It served a purpose at one time, uh, but now I think that there's probably some tweaks that we can make to not make to not have those rules. So 
okay, I'm rambling, but what I'm trying to say is those rural taxpayers, those rural school districts are sending tens of millions of dollars that are being re back to the state being redistributed to other school districts that do not hold their values. So you might think that in your little bubble that you don't need school choice, that it's not important, um, that it doesn't affect you even if we had it, but your tax dollars are funding the indoctrination of kids in different school districts. And guess what? When your kids grow up, they're going to be in college with those with those students. Those students are going to be our future leaders. They're going to be uh, setting the culture of our future. So it should be an issue that we all uh, care about. And I hope I ran on and I, I ran on that issue. That was a big difference between my opponent and I. Um, and thank you to Senator Cruz, who endorsed me in part based on that issue, and uh, American Federation of Children, who supported me there uh, up against the teachers unions. But I hope that I can show uh, my hopefully future colleagues that it's not something that, that we need to be scared of. It's something that we can really make an argument for and get those rural communities and hopefully some of those Democrats on board. Thank you. I love it. Um, this is amazing. I'm, we're going to open it up to questions. I feel like we could probably sit here um, all night and or all day and into the night and talk about this, but I, we want to open it up to y'all. What questions do you all have about what we've been talking about? Um, before I take anybody's question, I want to point out something that I think is lost in this conversation. Um, I had my colleague, who Michael Barba, who is our K through 12 policy expert, tell me exactly how much money we funded kids last year. Does anyone have any idea of how much every single student, public school student, 5.5 million public school students, what the, the cost, what we funded them last year? 7,000, how much? 14,000, 11,000, 12, 15. No, you're all under. It was over 16, thousand dollars y'all and then we are inundated with stories and stories but what i actually want to point out now do you know how many of our kids the percentage of our kids that can actually read on grade level a little higher 40 percent so just keep that in mind as we're talking about this and asking questions and figuring out to, to Stacy's point about innovation and about bipartisanship and about how we can do better and we know we can do better for kids. Think about those numbers, whether it's right now or through the day, and understand that we are all, again, the mom's here, the mom's watching. This is not a political issue. This is about our children. So questions? Yes, Michelle. So a population that doesn't often get discussed in this issue is um, special ed students. And that's something that means a lot to me. So we've pivoted a lot with my oldest daughter and with my youngest, my son, he's in a micro school and we've kind of moved around with my oldest, but my middle child is deaf and goes to te Texas school for the deaf. It's not easy to find ASL teachers um, and it's not easy to find the community for her, the culture. So I'm curious if anybody knows um, how the innovation um, part worked in other states that have school choice for special ed students in particular. I can, ju I can jump in, are you? Okay, um, so that is a fantastic question. We know that there are so many amazing special ed providers and I'm not sure if, you, so you're going to, you're, Daughter, you said your daughter is going to a public school, a public special ed, public state. Okay, that's great. And it's here, right here. Right, that's what I thought. So that's amazing. And we need more to make sure that wherever children are, I'm not sure if you moved here for that school. Okay, but what I know, so two things. One, we were blessed when that the CARES funding came down Governor Abbott utilized that funding to create a program called SSES that was able to give grants to, to parents like yourself to be able to get additional services. And then we went back to the legislature and we codified that. He signed it into law in June, which was huge. It's $1,500 grants, major success for special needs students. But to your point, um, there are special needs students and the reality is a lot of our schools can't be everything to every student. 
And the importance of noting that is there are parents who have special needs students. You said that you just happen to live here. There are parents who are willing and need to be able to get to some of our really high performing special ed private schools. We have over 50 here in Texas, but we have a ton that would like to operate if they could fund and support the kids. A perfect example is the Key Center in Dallas. It's been around since 1967. They have been a huge leader in dyslexia and autism. Their students are outperforming all of our public school kids. I'm telling you that. But what they also did is they bring in public school special ed teachers and they teach them they're really innovative processes to help these students do better. Now just think if the dollars could follow the child, how many more key centers could pop up in our state? In communities that don't have them, that you have a general special ed teacher or a couple, maybe if you're lucky, but that they could learn and actually go in and teach children based on how kids with special needs learn. So that's a little bit about what we are trying to do, because I agree. Actually, growing up, I was a special needs student with an IEP. Um, my, my left eye doesn't track. And so I, I had a mama bear like you in the audience who fought for me. We have so many moms out there that need that. Stacey, I know that you have some. I just wanted to add that you know many of the states who started with school choice programs did specifically start with special needs population, Arizona, Florida, Tennessee, et cetera. And what they found was, you know, again, every child's unique. And so some, and we keep learning more and more about how we learn, all of us. And so we're able to better serve all students based on knowing better and better how we learn. And we know things like if children with autism, they are tend to do best in environments that are designed for them. Children with Down syndrome tend to do best in an environment that is uh, blended with a, a general population. Um, children with dyslexia, lots of intervention in second through fifth grade, and then after that tend to be well supported in a more traditional model. And so each of these different situations Blind and deaf is a great example. Um, obviously, the state has intervened there traditionally, but there's a lot of opportunity for children to go to a more traditional high school once they've been supported to get to a certain point, and then depending on the kinds of supports they need. At the school I went to, one of my peers who also went to MIT with me was blind, and he had a mama bear who joined the school board to make sure that he could come to that school. And so that is the history of where a lot of this has started and there is no magic bullet um, it's going to continue to take getting better and better in these spaces knowing how to support each of us with the things that we need um, and right now some things are well done in the public sector some things are well done in the private sector and sometimes families are having to piece together the services that they need to support their children and again having that flexibility to craft that for your student tends to result in better outcomes for everyone. Thank you. All right, I think we have time on this panel for one more question. Hi there, my name's Dina Moore. I, um, I too have a child at Texas School for the Deaf and I am uh, appointed by the governor on the governing board of Texas School for the Deaf. And a lot of reasonings they give is that they're behind in the education is that, well, the solution is CRT and social emotional learning to improve the children's learning abilities. Those are the solutions that they're coming up with. <laughs> yes. And so I'm asking you, um, are you working with the TEA or TASB to help give good alternatives to these lousy curriculums that they're wanting to implement? Are you working with SHAC committees in all the districts um, to show them other opportunities that are out there? Um, I know I personally would love some help and guidance to be an effective leader on that board, to be a voice for choice, for, for better choices there. So those are my questions. 
Um, that's crazy. Just <laughs> that's crazy that that's how we're trying to. That's crazy. Okay, but to answer your question, yes, I'm not sure if um, many of you had the time to watch the SBOE meeting that took place a week and a half ago. Um, I've got, I've got some heads nodding. So we are absolutely working to make sure that that was on the teaks, the social studies teaks, which we found a lot of really crazy things that were in there that were for sexualizing children and things like that. Um, I'll point out my colleague again, Michael Barba. He sprung into action. We were given one week. We hired a um, professor that had a uh, background in history. He was a um, he's a collegiate level history professor. And we were able to pull out all the insanity in there, go in and craft testimony. If you watch, he did a beautiful job pointing out where this is a problem. Yes, it was amazing. It was amazing. So the to, to answer your question, absolutely. Part of parent empowerment and why we're all here, you notice we talk a lot about public schools. I know Stacy has children in public schools. She grew up going to a public magnet school. I know that Heidi grew up going to a very small private school that reflected their values. As Ellen was talking about, her daughter is in a private school right now, but they have phenomenal public schools. She's just trying to figure out the age level and where they are. We, part of empowering parents is making sure that Number one, first and foremost, that the parent, the mamas, the dads, the people that love their children most have the power to select the best school. We want that if you're in a community where there are amazing public schools, that is awesome. But we should never have a parent that walks out of a meeting and ends up in a school board and ends up on Fox News because they have lost their mind because they are being taught the same things that you're saying that they're trying to teach special ed students. That is crazy. And part of empowering parents is making sure that they have transparency into what they're learning. They have quality regardless of where that comes from and that they have the respect to choose the school and the curriculum that best serves their child. We are at time, we have another phenomenal panel coming up. Um, I just wanna express my gratitude again to all of you ladies who are leaders in this space and making sure that giving a voice to all of us moms, whether it's through your amazing work as a mom and recognizing and having that communication directly to Senator Cruz, Stacy, who's been involved in this on the front lines of innovation and, and supporting all of us moms and all of our work, Ellen, who, you know, is is headed is um, I'm we're, I'm working for a C3 here. So um, we I just anybody who is going to the Capitol, this is a nonpartisan bipartisan lock arms with the mama bear next to you and say we are in this together. And we are the ones in control. So thank you, ladies.
to interrupt these conversations, but we do want to get you guys to lunch in a timely way. We'll start in about 60 seconds. And as soon as we can find Mandy. Alrighty, we'll just go ahead and get started. And if we could just locate Mandy Drogan to come back and fill this seat. She has not left the building that I'm aware of, so. <laughs> We will fill that in all in good time. Uh, I'm Emily Sass. I am a senior fellow for education policy here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. I have, no, no you are good. You are good. Girl, you're doing back-to-back -back stuff. Um, I have a 16-month-old named Charlotte who is home with her dad right now, and she is sweet and darling, and we are already talking about schools, and if we're, you know, how early you can get on the waiting list for some of the great charter schools near us. <laughs> Things like that. So this is just even more relevant to me uh, than it has been working in this space for uh, years now. Um, we just talked about education freedom, what it is, what it can mean for Texas students. And we're going to zoom out a little bit and talk about parent empowerment as a writ large, if you will. Uh, what's going wrong, what's going well, and what needs to change. Or if you want to think about it, it's the past, present, and future of parent empowerment. And that includes choice as a major factor but a little bit more than choice that we want to discuss as well uh, within that and I, i'll just say here i think um we could say that the, the past of parent empowerment has been things have been going well people have just kind of assumed i'd say before the pandemic that things are, are probably working out for their kids parents you know just wanted to put their baby in a school and know that things were going to be okay and uh, that the baby was going to make some friends and everything was going to be good. Um, and then the pandemic plus multiple cultural issues over the last couple of years have just really brought to the fore that we can't take that for granted, um, which has led to a ballooning of interest in what we're just calling overall parent empowerment, which is really just the concept that moms and dads or whoever has that parent, a parent role in a child's life should be able to make the key core decisions about a child's upbringing, especially their education. So joining me to dig into this are our panelists, Mandy Drogan, uh, who is the campaign manager for Next Generation Texas, which is our education center here at TPPF. Uh, she's been the president in the past for the Texas Federation for Children PAC with a very impressive win-loss ratio over the last couple of election cycles. Um, before that, she was at the Heritage Foundation. She is one of the top ed reform uh, act, uh, leaders in Texas. And then we have Courtney Bagley, who is an education coordinator here at TBPF. Uh, Courtney manages curriculum development and professional development uh, for the foundation's education programs. She has worked in many different capacities in public education in both South Carolina and Texas over the years, and she is a seventh generation Texan. So it doesn't, it doesn't get more far back than that, actually. <laughs> like, seven, like that's, you know, yeah, you didn't get here on the Mayflower, but nobody in Texas really did. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, you know, there were those ships that coming out of the harbor in, yeah, yeah my, my ancestors came through the bay. <laughs> Um, and then Carrie Isaac, who is, among many things, the executive director of DeWitt, which is a nonprofit providing assistance to veterans. She works to advance health and wellness in her community via several nonprofits and fundraising events, including Helping Hands and It's Time Texas. Uh, she moved heaven and earth to make sure that the counties near her had all the PPE that they needed to get through the pandemic and keep families and kids safe. She has run an Ironman in her spare time, so she has the stamina to take on just about anything, including a legislative session. Uh, and her husband, Jason Isaac, leads the Life Powered Project here at TPPF, and we are so thrilled that you can be here today as well. Okay, so let's just dive right into questions. Uh, and Manny, I want to start with you because I want you to recap for us uh, some of the the, the way that TPPF has been trying to explain parent empowerment uh, in some of the other events we've done as we're uh, explaining this to the general public so that y'all have this in your mind too. So can you recap for us sort of those four essential parent rights of quality, transparency, respect, and choice? 
Absolutely, happy to do that. Um, so all of this came about because, I say all of this, as you alluded to, with just a, a groundswell of people going, what is going on in my kid's school? And what we found that there are terms that are, are deemed kind of divisive, right? But what's not divisive, what every parent, pretty much every member of society shakes their head to, unless you're far off on the left crazy side, like, and I mean like nuts that don't recognize that parents, the ones who are raising the child, who have their best interest at heart, they love their child more than anyone ever could. They want what's best for them more than any system, more than any government bureaucracy, and more than any bureaucrat could. And they ultimately should be making the choices to get the education that will set them up for a successful life. And here's where we come to parent empowerment. Parent empowerment is all about making sure that there is transparency in what is being taught to your child. Regardless of where they are, you have a right to know what their education looks like, what their curriculum looks like, and quite frankly, what their lesson plans look like. So what we have heard with CRT and SEL and DEI, and I don't know, there's a whole alphabet of different things out there that are just, they're, they're sliding in, right? And we've got a whole crop of administrators and union leaders and people that are pushing this down into our classrooms, and we finally got a chance to see it. We knew it was happening, it's been bubbling under, right? We've seen, we've, we've had divisiveness, we knew this was happening. So with parent empowerment, number one was transparency. Number two is quality. I mentioned this in the, in the last panel, 60%, 60% of our public school children are not reading on grade level. That's horrifying. But let me give you something that's even worse. We know that if a child is not reading on grade level by the third grade, by the third grade, there is only a 5% chance they will ever catch up. That means 95% chance they will never catch up if they are in our public schools. Now, again, that doesn't mean that every public school is bad. We have amazing public schools here in Texas and we celebrate those and we wanna make sure they are fully funded and have all the resources that they need to be awesome. Amen. That's right, amen, I don't know who's, yes, ma'am. <laughs> but we have to have quality. The third part of this is respect. And this goes back to the whole entire premise of all of this is that nobody loves your child like you do. I, I do love your child and I do want your child to do well in life, but I am not, my children are my concern, right? I, I trust you as a mom, which is why we want to empower you. I trust you as a mom, as a grandma, as a caregiver, whatever it is that you love that child that you're looking at every day, helping them get dressed, tie their shoes, putting the food on the table, preparing for their future. You love them more than I could, more than anyone up here more than anybody in this building more than anybody on the face of the earth and you should have the respect of everyone to make the choices recognizing that you love them and want what's best for them more than anybody else the respect that you deserve to make those choices for them and that brings us to the fourth component which is so important to all of this and it's kind of the foundation which is why it's number four you should have the choice if your public school is doing great, that is wonderful. I, that's what we want. Somebody asked me when we were getting this all going and said, well, okay, Mandy, you've been, you've been in this movement for over a decade. And as Heidi Cruz alluded to, the numbers show we have tons of studies. In fact, there's 25 empirical studies that show that private school choice benefits the public sector because it creates the competition and the motivation to do more and do better, right? That's just common sense at this point. Okay, but so what happens, what if the public schools get better? What if they do better? And I said, hallelujah, I could just stay at home and not have to constantly try and juggle. How do I get work done? How do I make phone calls? How do I serve everybody in Texas and at TPPF? How do I carry this banner? That would be amazing, I would love that. That's what we want, right? We just want our society, the 5.5 million kids that are in public schools, but the ones, the 60% y'all that aren't on grade level, we want them to have the same opportunities that us mama bears in this room are fighting for. So that is where our entire message to everybody is that parents should be empowered. Parents are the ultimate authority. They love their children and they must 
have the transparency, the quality, the respect, and ultimately the choice of where their child goes to school. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Mandy. Um, and then Courtney, I want to follow up on that with a lot of parents, you know, when we've talked to parents about this, it's a huge majority of parents would agree with all four of those things. But there are some parents who would agree with all those things and then think to themselves, okay, yep, yeah, but my kids are in a good place right now. So I, it doesn't, I'm, I don't, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Why should this matter to every parent? I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, I taught public school for 20 years and Emily called me yesterday and we had like five minutes. I could have talked to her for probably three hours because I have so many things to say about that. But I wanna start with, I wanna just, what, one of the things we talked about yesterday and I printed off an example. Um, in uh, my, my parents live in a rural, rural area. I live in a rural area. I, my kids went to a great school. They had an amazing history teacher for four years. It was me. Um, I, um, so I knew what they were being taught, um, but, but my parents have really dealt with this because I've sort of generated an awareness in them of what's going on and their friends who are older don't get why it's a big deal in a rural area. And one of the issues is not necessarily maybe about the teachers that your kids have, but about the programs that are coming into the school. You know, a lot of these schools don't have the resources to be able to manage these state requirements. And so they bring in third party applications to help them um, fulfill these requires, requirements. So I just want to read to you something. This came from um, a local school district. Um, this was something that was in a um, software program that is designed for K through three. Okay. Um, and this was one of the lessons that they had that they were supposed to work through. And I think this might have been, I, I mean, I think the purpose of this, I don't know for sure, but it, this sounds to me like a social emotional learning requirement. And so if you don't know what DEI is, or if you don't know what social emotional learning is, your first homework tonight is to go home and look these things up. Because a lot of times I think we don't know what we're advocating for because we don't know how to recognize it when we see it, okay? So I'm just gonna read this. This is a K through three um, lesson. And the title of the lesson is Celebrating Diversity. There have always been strict ideas about how we should think, act, and live. There are unwritten rules about how we should live, how sh we should look, how our bodies and minds should work, or how we should love, who, who we should love or marry. But people shouldn't need to fit into rigid categories. Human beings are extremely diverse and we can rewrite the rules. We are different sexes and have gen different gender identities. We are boys and girls. We are non-binary. This means we don't feel like a boy or girl. We can be born into a body that matches how we identify. This is called being cisgender. But we can also be born into a body that does not match our gender identity. This is called being transgender. And in another lesson um, called forming an identity, this is the one, I have like eight of these slides, but this is the paragraph. I've had this since April. This one makes me mad every time. Imagine your parents raise you to cheer for a certain sports team. You may see yourself as a fan of that team. If you begin to cheer for a new team, you might experience guilt, but that doesn't mean you should avoid cheering for a new team. Forming beliefs separate from your family and others is an important part of your identity. It is also an important part of growing up, which can be difficult. Now, this was given to me by a really good teacher who had been given a software and had no idea what had been given to her, okay? And a lot of times these software programs are used by substitutes or by young teachers who also do not know what has been given to them. And so you open up these innocuous lessons and maybe the first one's good and maybe the second one's good, but when you get deeper into that third or fourth lesson, these are how these ideas are creeping in even to our really good conservative rural schools in Texas. And we don't even know it because it's all happening at school. And there's no book that you're 
child is taking home with you for you to page through. Let's be clear here. I mean, I, I love I, I love less expensive educational materials, which are often available <laughs> online, but these are not publicly available online. These are copyrighted materials that are licensed to school districts, and it's kind of hard to find them. I don't know if some of y'all have tried. There are some stories about that. I was going to say, <laughs> if, if for anybody, it was um, Fort Worth ISD? I believe so. Fort Worth ISD, if y'all yeah, saw on the news, there was a mother that was requesting to know this stuff, y'all, the stuff that they call programs, because they don't want to call it curriculum, because then they can skirt through, just so we all know how this is happening. She requested it. First, they ignored her. Then they came back and said, we're going to charge you $1,250 to have access to this because it's proprietary information and it could cause competition for whoever wrote it. But that is how this system has been set up, right? To protect their own. That's what's going on. And that's what we're talking about. That is crazy. I've said this, I think, crazy about five times today just, because this is crazy. And I just want to reemphasize K through three. K through three. K through three. K through three. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Enough said. I, yeah. And, and I just thought of something else too. You know, we should be really grateful for um, Ken Paxton because there was another um, there was another deal that they tried to pass where they wanted to tie um, Title IX stuff to school lunches, and we're really getting some. Yep. The way this is being played in the press is really, it's really, it, it's making us look bad, right? Like they're really trying to play it. But the, but the truth is it's a way that the Biden administration is trying to backdoor um, because what it would do is like, you would have to have access to bathrooms and um, the, you know, transgender sports and all of that deal. That's how they're trying to backdoor it. So you think it's not gonna affect you because you go to a really small school um this it, it's everywhere it's insidious and we have to be like like lions every day yeah. so quick context title nine was a federal program originally uh created to ensure that women and men had equal access to sports programs uh so title nine is it makes girls sports possible that's the what it was set up to do so it's being used leverage to bring a whole lot of other issues, they just often refer to it as, as SOGI issues, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, into states by saying, if you are not inclusive enough to meet the federal uh, administration's uh, preferences, uh, then they will hold withhold federal funding for you uh, in other areas. So the what we're looking at is the federal government trying to withhold money for school lunches for students because the state of Texas does not comply with what the federal government would like to see in the area of bathrooms and sports participation. Carrie, you have been on the campaign trail a lot lately. You just won a primary in Texas House District 73. So what is one of the biggest parent concerns you have been hearing as you have been interacting with a wide range of parents in that district that you've been, been canvassing? What, what are you hearing? Yes, I'm hearing from thousands of concerned parents. I have two boys. I have a sophomore at Texas Tech. He's a pickleball champion. And I have a senior in high school. And I'm saying constantly, I'm so thankful that my boys are not young right now in the schools. I was so naive to all of this um, during so. But I hope to have grandchildren, not too soon, but someday that will be in the public schools. So. The number one issue I hear from concerned parents is the indoctrination going on. They're very concerned. They're hearing, they're seeing the books, they're hearing about the books of sexualization, uh, gender identity, CRT. I received an image from a teacher that is also a concerned parent from her teacher training, a PowerPoint presentation of eight books, suggested reading for our teachers and every single book, all eight had to deal with CRT. So our teachers are being trained to indoctrinate our children. I also received an email that was forwarded to me from a current state rep that is holding, held round tables because she is concerned about all the book banning and the censorship that is going on uh, of books that 
highlight the life of a LGBTQ plus student and, and children of color. So they're fighting back, trying to fight back. I fortunately last month, um, Grapevine Colleyville ISD, they just passed some uh, policies to fight back on uh, pronoun usage, bathroom usage, and yes, so, you know, we can fight back. I did, I want to, to read a short statement from this board member. The classroom is a place of intellectual learning, not ideological training. I am proud to say that I, with this package of policies, we have neutralized the classroom of GCISD. Teachers have been unleashed to focus on core instruction and invest in the lives of education of their students. The days of adults pushing their worldview and propagandizing our children at taxpayer expense are over. Yes, so we can, we can fight back. We can make our voices heard. We have to make our voices heard and find out what the parents did at GCISD. Oh, you go, go ahead, Mandy. I, was say, I, I believe you're talking about, I think her name is Shannon Braun, who, yes, okay, I don't know if you've seen this article in the Dallas Express, but I read that and I, that is something, so if you haven't read it, you should read it because to the point of the question previous of are we, all of us in this room, um, as well as TPPF and every other organization that realizes that, that the indoctrination is happening and Shannon ran and she came in and this article tells you that one of the things that stood out that was a great statement she also said that they went through the books and they found 18,500 vendors 18,500 vendors that had a hand in pushing this nonsense this crazy this this nefarious indoctrination into our school system they got them off the books they got them out of the school system. It was amazing. And it's really something here at TVPF, we developed something called the school board toolkit to educate these members. And we'll make sure that all of you have it. If you would like to share it with your, your school districts, absolutely, yes. Everybody's lots, lots of shaking heads. We will make sure that you have it after this because that school, that, that toolkit, the school board toolkit is so important to empowering our school board members that can go in and do this and so it's happening at multiple levels but the reality is is it's a battle that unless we collectively join together and talk to those decision makers the big pink building down the street i think i'm pointing the right way um and we and we make our voices heard and that's where this comes in is that there is a small but very loud group of people that do not align with our values. I don't know whose values they align with, to be perfectly honest, because I have several friends that identify as liberals or Democrats, and they're like, that's crazy too. But this is what's happening. So I, I thank you for a legislator yes. fighting to indoctrinate our children. We yes. have legislators yes. now. And something to this point, I, I actually get asked this, not to, I know you haven't asked the question, but I kind of want to point this out that. People said, well, why? How is this happening and why are people standing in the way? And the reality is, it's the same reason that anything truly happens. It's money. It's money, y'all. It's money and power. Over $16,000 per student. Do you know what the average private school costs in Texas? $9,645. What that means is that you have a very powerful group of people, and we hear this, legislators, I know when Jason was a state rep, and I know that you will encounter this as well, that in private meetings, they say, I know this is great. Ellen was talking about it. I know that this would benefit. And then there's a but. There's the but. The special interests, the unions, the ones that want to, that have infiltrated at the highest levels and push this down into our classroom, they are the ones that are standing apart from this, are standing, are standing in the way of empowering you. I just want to make sure that we really call out what it is. And what they've done is a very strategic marketing plan. The teacher union spent $3 billion a year to fight you, 
Just so you know, that's what they're doing. Yeah. They're fighting you with $3 billion a year, but, and it's to maintain control. Don't you feel like parents are wising up to the They are. Y'all are the special interest group in town, and that's why today is so important, and that's why empowering parents is so important, and that's why encouraging Governor Abbott, who's out talking about parent empowerment. We've got, you mentioned the Attorney General. We've got so many, Angela Paxton's going to be here later, Heidi Cruz, Ted, I mean, there's so many people that are in your corner that are trying to make sure that you have the resources and the information you need to fight back and say that union, that person, Randy Weingarten at the top of it, but it all filters down y'all and it's here in Texas. And that's what they're doing. This is what this comes down to is the money and the powers that benefit from $16,000 a year. That is what it comes down to. And that's where your voice is so important. Amen, Mandy. I just want to yep. just want to um, emphasize this with one other anecdote. Um, recently, this was huge news in the education policy world. I don't know how much it filtered down to the rest of us. So I'm sorry. It is welcome. Join the bubble. Um, the National School Boards Association sent a letter to the FBI during uh, COVID, when, when all this kind of started, I guess this was last year, uh, families were getting more involved in school board meetings. So the National Association of School Boards sent a letter to the FBI asking Merrick Garland and his FBI folks to investigate parents who were coming to school board meetings to express their concerns and opposition to some of this stuff because, and I quote, well, this no, imply, uh, opposing mask mandates and critical race theory were, quote, a form of domestic terrorism. I, I don't think I would classify a parent frustrated about these things, even even if that parent is yelling. A form of domestic terrorism. I, I you know, we can ask them to use inside voices, but that I, that I'm not, I'm not like, that's not worth writing a letter to the FBI about. There may have been some threats issued or something like that, but they just classified parents who were concerned about these issues as a group of people that should be investigated by federal law enforcement. So these concerns go all the way to the top and filter all the way down to Texas. So I want to turn it back around to families. I emphasize, I, I mentioned that story because I want to highlight the fact that we don't, parents don't always have the respect of the people who run their children's education right now. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is that they haven't seen parents as being in charge. That may be parents' fault in, to some extent because parents have assumed that things are going well. Not all parents, but some parents. Um, but they haven't seen parents as being in charge. So I'm curious, do y'all think that parents see themselves as being in charge of their children's education? Do you think that is shifting? And do you think that school administrators are beginning to see parents as being in charge of maybe beginning education. Yep. maybe beginning but i do know there are a lot of frustrated parents that aren't feeling heard um i i spoke to the school board had two minutes and i practiced that speech over and over and over trying to get every single word i can get in in two minutes it's ridiculous and and parents aren't feeling heard they're not but the colleyville grapevine parents were heard i believe there are power in numbers and 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 that's one thing that you said earlier, like, why should every parent worry? Because our children are under attack, all of them. Right. Courtney, do you have something to add? There? Yeah, so um, there's this political theory called the theory of the lesser magistrate. And what it says basically is like, you can't, you need a layer of protection between you and like whatever the big government is. And for this topic, it's the school board and it's the school administrators and you know i was in public school for 20 years my i have four boys okay when my youngest was in elementary school my husband told me i probably shouldn't go back to the elementary school because my methods were not effective <laughs> so he took over dealing with those teachers um anyway we had some issues on the bus a few times but we don't talk about that um but what i would just say is like you know, you, the, the first time they hear from you should not be at the school board meeting. Um, I would just really encourage any of you who have kids in school to be just involved every 
day, every week, you know, find opportunities to, teachers are under a lot of pressure right now. There are so many things that they're having to do to make up for COVID and um, so many district requirements and school requirements. It's really just ridiculous. And they really have not had a significant pay raise since like 2004. It's something crazy like that, okay? Um, you, I would just encourage you to, um, you know, send notes to school, send, you know, Chick-fil-A gift cards to your, to the teachers, thank the principal, like build those relationships now, get to know the school board members, you know, they, they all have public emails and public phone numbers, they should, so that you can get in touch with them and really build that relationship um, because they are the greatest layer of protection between you and what's coming down. And if they know how you feel at the beginning and they sort of have like a temperature gauge on the community ahead of time, then, you know, maybe some of these issues won't be, you know, as, as big. But I think that building that relationship, it, it helps you to see it from their perspective and them to see it from your perspective. Because really, at the end of the day, we should all be working for the same thing, which is building our kids up to be the leaders of the next generation. And so um, that's the biggest thing that I've seen is like, and, and I went to a school board meeting and I spoke as a teacher for something that happened during COVID. And there were some parents that were really misbehaving at that school board meeting. And we were on the same side, but like, I didn't want to be associated with them as an employee of the district. Like I was speaking for teachers who didn't feel like they could speak for themselves and, you know, I really felt like I was already taking a risk with my reputation. And so, um, I don't know, that's, I would just really be encouraging for you to actively get involved with, you know, appreciating those people every day and every week. Courtney, you make a good point that as we're talking about quality, transparency, respect and choice, respect goes both ways. And we need to show that respect to the people who are stepping up and serving our panel after lunch we'll be talking about stepping up and serving and getting up and getting engaged uh, with those uh, elected representatives but it's important to make sure that we're doing it in a way that's going to be effective um, but that we also you know expect that that respect is going to be shown back to us and then you know, Mandy says this a lot, uh, the best way to make sure that you are respected and heard is to have some kind of consequence that kicks in. So that's where, you know, that's where choice comes back. <laughs> I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, Mandy, and I know you've got something to say about funding as well. I, I, can, I can, and yes, the, 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 the choice, right, is that I, I tell this story. Um, I have a really spirited five and a half year old. I am told she is a mini me. I was also told by a good friend that they would have never wanted to be my mom. I was like, mm -hmm. she's a very good friend, so I took it as a compliment, just because I, I'm, I guess I'm like a dog with a bone, but my five-year-old, five and a half-year-old is very, very spirited, and she has her own opinions, and I love that, and I do not want to discipline that out of her. But much like with every government entity, she needs to know who's in charge. And I love her, and she's smart and intelligent and all the wonderful things. I love her more than anything in this world. But mama's in charge. So when I say, Grace Marie, you need to pick that up. You made a mess. It's time to clean it up, right? Sometimes she just kind of looks at me or ignores me. And so I'll say, Grace Marie, I asked you to do that, and I mean do it. If not, there's a, and she can fill it in, there's a consequence which means maybe you don't get to go to the playground in the, after, the evening and play with your friend down the street, or maybe you miss swimming this weekend, or maybe you miss dance class, whatever it is, there is a consequence. And usually just saying that word or her repeating it back to me, she knows mom means business, but here's the problem with what's going on when that you fund a monopoly where there is no consequence, is we see parents show up at school meetings their hair is on fire, they are mad because they didn't start out that way. And y'all know that it's kind of the same thing. And look, we've all lost our temper with our, at least I have, you know, where you get louder. And that's what we see these parents doing. They're so mad. The teacher didn't listen to them. The principal didn't listen to them. The superintendent didn't listen to them. And they are showing up and they are mad and they are demoralized and they feel like nobody cares and they care. This, that, that's what we see is passion for their kid, right? They're mad and they may not be doing it in the right way, but they're passionate and they love their child. And that is ultimately what choice is about. We talked about it. 
If the public school system, if the ones that are failing our students, whether it's in curriculum or in values, whichever it is, if they are failing our expectations, they have to know that there is a consequence. And it's not where they can just kick it down the road and say, we'll deal with this later, because guess what our children do? They grow up, sadly. And that's in the third reality, grade once, is, is, the, is the powers that be, the union leaders, the people that make money off our system, the $16,000 per student. Let me also put another thing before we go to Q&A, one more thing, is that since 1970, 1970, y'all, the per student funding in Texas has gone up, contrary to what they say, 167%. That's the per student funding. Guess how much teacher pay has come up? And this is where what Courtney's talking about is so important. Since 1970, when adjusted for inflation, it's gone up 11%. Where is that money? Why are we not paying our amazing teachers to educate the, the, our children with the education that we want? There is a problem, and that goes back to there is a concerted effort, a $3 billion a year effort to try and pretend like that we are opposed to teachers. That we, and I say we as in parents, because we were the domestic terrorists. I, that, I'm me right there. Um, that's what they were calling us. And they painted a false narrative and they told lies and it was propaganda and that is what is going on. And I'm saying it right now, I'm saying it to all y'all, I'm saying it to everybody that's watching because we know what the problem is. It is not the amazing teachers that want to teach quality curriculum and uphold our values. And we can't forget that. So when teachers like Courtney are up there, we need to support them and give them a voice because they're scared. And she sent me more screenshots of teachers reaching out to her, recognizing what she's doing now. And Carrie has done it too, where the teachers are afraid. They'll lose their jobs, they'll lose their pensions, they're gonna be disciplined. And we had, what is it, Northside ISD? Bear County moms, I know that you guys are in here. Yeah, right here, right here. Y'all had a superintendent that was out there and telling teachers, I'm trapped political stuff, engaging with your tax dollars, electioneering, breaking the law, telling teachers I'm tracking. I know that only three teachers have gone to vote. You can go with taxpayer time and money. You can get on this bus that we're paying for and we will take you to the polls. And you better vote for this bond because if you don't, as a teacher stood up on YouTube that was up there and said, he told us if we didn't, we could get pay cuts. This is going on in our schools. Just for the record, bonds are supposed to be for facilities and large capital expenditures. They should not be impacting ongoing annual expenses, so just payroll. Just Thank you, policy <laughs> expert. So I want to open it up for questions, but I just I, I, I want to make sure that everybody knows really what's happening and the forces that be that are against you and me. And now they know we're not going to stand for it. Amen. Raised hands. And I just want to plug. Well, yes, ma'am. Let's I'll, I'll say my thing later. Go ahead. OK. Taxpayer funded lobbyists, right? So you're talking about all of the money that comes in, that's $3 billion, and you're talking about parents have an empowerment. How do we compete with that? When we go to the Capitol year after year after year, and there are bills that get written, and then the money comes in for those legislators to look the other way. Those legislator to bees that are in this room, Carrie and Michelle and everyone else, what can we do differently as parents at that Capitol when we're talking to these legislators? I know that they get on ballots and they need votes. I haven't seen that that Chick-fil-A card and the chocolate helps. Pain is what helps with these legislators. So how can we get together all speaking the same language and put pressure on these people and say we're not going to vote you in next time if you don't we have two minutes and a lot of people who want to have, ask questions okay. so i hope i don't get too political but um these groups have very powerful big megaphones and they'll threaten to take you out and will lie about you i've seen it done it was done to my husband um you can fight back by being a louder voice for the legislators that are doing the right thing well said, Carrie. Uh, they they believe that there's a certain group of people who will always vote this issue, and if they know that other people will vote this issue, then it matters. They'll smear the lady in the black right here, Michelle. 
the, the people online want to hear your question. But you're good. It's just that. Um, so how do we recruit uh, and where do we get the funding for conservative uh, candidates that want to run for board? Because um, it's so hard to recruit and then it's so hard to get funding for them. Stay for the 1215 panel. Uh, during lunch, and we will talk about everything we can on the C3 side for that process. We're not going to talk about how to start a pack. But right, but I can. Yeah, you, so go ahead. Um, in before I came over to TPPF, um, which was just in May, my experience, and this this was talked about a little bit. Um, I was the president of the Texas Federation for Children Pack, and there they are one that it's a single issue um, pack. You either support parents and parental empowerment, or you don't. There's no, we're not dancing around this. It's, it, you, there's no, you either support a parent's right, you can love and support and ensure that public schools are doing great and that's your job. Public schools do great when parents are listened to, not when the pushers and the, the benefactors of CRT and SEL and all these other things that we've talked about. That is how, but so at, from a, Again, we'll talk about that, but this is it is y'all are doing it right now. This is being broadcast. They are watching. I just want you to know they are watching and I want that. We want that. They need to know that there is a room here full of mama bears that are learning. You're learning the facts. You now know that when adjusted for inflation, spending has gone up 167%. You know that 60% of our students are failing. You know you are armed with facts. And that's what we want to do here is make sure that you know and, and make sure that you're using your voice. And that's what's so important about having this group of women that we have banded together. We are not, I mean, I see we, we are locked together. You are here. You are participating because you are engaged and you see what's happening. Amen. We are, one more question just because you're right there and then we'll grab you <laughs> as soon as we break. Go ahead, ma'am. Hello, um, I'm a mama bear from a suburban, um, relatively large district, suburban to Austin. And I have observed um, since um, we've had kids in the school district consecutively since uh, 99, um, I have observed that um, the corruption, the bureaucratic corruption goes incredibly deep. It's incredibly systemic in the school district. It reaches from legal department over to the counseling department, over the school board. And even though we have a pretty good movement and a good chance to flip the board in November, how will the new school board members find the agencies um, to replace the current agencies that push all this? What's the alternative to TASB? Um, not everybody is a lawyer that can successfully implement the political policies and, and make it legally congruent, right? With state law and all of that. What's the alternative to these teacher unions that every teacher is forced almost to pay dues to, right? Yes. What are the alternatives that have our conservative viewpoint in mind and our rights as parents as opposed to just do the stop, listen, and um, hear, and that's all they do, right? With the grievances and with the board, uh, that's all they do. There's no change. There's nothing going to be changed. The, the support organizations, um, yeah, they don't change. They don't get elected or stand up for a vote is what you're saying. And I will agree there is a there, there is a need for more of this. I do want to highlight one encouraging organization. You were talking about teachers unions. Uh, there's a group called ITT, Innovative Teachers of Texas, that was just started a couple of years ago. Their whole purpose is to provide uh, insurance and uh, legal advice, I believe, uh, for teachers, like no advocacy. They don't have issue statements. They are not going to campaign for somebody that you may not agree with. Their point is to get you those essential things that, that teachers actually do need like workplace insurance itt innovative teachers of texas uh, the texas education agency has actually started creating their own school board training materials to try to provide an alternative uh, to what the texas association of school boards is providing now it's a state agency providing those trainings i will say they are they're, they're, they're pretty good 
Um, and they've got a whole, they've got a page with a list of resources and research on school board governance and how to do it effectively. So if you don't trust their trainings, like just go to that list and start reading the research that they have posted up for you. It's actually quite helpful. We've got a school board toolkit that we've been creating to try to help with that. I'm sorry. Yes, I will make sure I have your email and I will get it and send it to you. I just sent it to a friend a couple weeks ago. Um, so those are the ones that are coming to mind here. Again, there is more needed in this space. Like you said, there's really no alternative, if you will, at school board association. Um, but, but people are beginning to create these. There's a need for continued support there. Any additions to that, ladies? All right, we will break for lunch then. We have 15 minutes 